here we are at a wall scouring plant. Uh, tell them a little bit about what this place does and, and why after we get the wool harvested off the sheet. Sure, we're at uh, Bowman Industries this morning in San Angelo, Texas. Uh, Bowman is one of the one of few scouring plants that are remaining in the United States and what they do is receive raw wool that's been baled. Um, most of the time it's going to bail on the ranch after shearing and then that wool is going to be shipped to a place uh, like, like this and go through a scouring plant which is going to clean um, that wool and remove all the grease and the dirt um, and then they'll dry that wool and repackage it into bales of scoured clean wool and then that will be sent off to further processing. To textile mills across textile the country. Mills, yep. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. So now we'll just go ahead and uh, meet Lad Hughes, the, the general manager of this facility and have him tell us a little bit more about the place. Great. All right. So Lad, just tell us a little bit about what Bowman Industries does here in San Angelo. Bowman, we, we do every aspect of, of the wool trade here. We buy wool at the door. Um, that's something that's uncommon in in Texas. Texas is mainly a warehouse driven uh, wool market where you know the grower takes his wool to a warehouse and it's sold from the warehouse but you know over the last several years the wool markets got so small uh, that you know a lot of the warehouses turn into feed stores uh, you know they do tires they do a lot of their stuff and wool is kind of a side kind of a side thing for them though you know there's, there's not that much volume of wool handled so about five years ago we started uh, buying wool here and now we handle you know as uh, well we're one of the larger warehouses left in Texas we get all the wool from Del Rio here and uh, we we offer it for sale here um, Mertzen is Mertzen still handles lots of wool Western here in, in San Angelo still does but there's a lot of the other ones that used to be big that have either closed the doors or like I said it's just kind of a side venue for them mm -hmm. it's not their main main goal anymore but uh, we store wool for several wool companies um, that you know they'll have it shipped in here and this is kind of a consolidation place and we get all types from all of the United States so uh, once it's brought in here and they tell us what to ship um, you know we make sure it's packaged properly and then we'll reload it on a container or wherever it's going um, for them here so we're, we're a storage facility we're a warehouse and then our main thing is washing wool so uh, our largest customer is probably Pendleton um, Pendleton's on the west coast and you know they're a big blanket manufacturer they have a men's wear line a ladies wear line um, and then Woolrich would be on the east coast in Pennsylvania and they're kind of the you know they do basically the same thing they're a large customer for us. Uh, Limpriere which is a, uh, out of Australia they do a lot of scouring we do a lot of their warehousing here but like I was telling you you know most of the wool in the United States is shipped out greasy so we wash you know the wool that we wash is going to stay here there's it's it's a tough market you know just because of you know global standards and how much cheaper it is to have it done in china or india um, most of the wool will get shipped out just like it is and sent over there and processed so what we process for the most part stays in the united states scouring is the first stage of processing so you know when you have you know i mean the growers come straight here and you know any of the wool that's washed it goes from here to the scouring plant and it doesn't matter what you're going to make out of out of wool the first stage is to have it scoured so we're just a first stage processing mm -hmm. we don't we don't have you know cards or combs we don't make top we simply wash it and then it goes on to uh, you know the mill that's going to use it after that but you know to wash wool um, you know you got to have you know basically hot water and soap yeah. it's, it's a, just a big washing machine but the main thing is to get the grease content out of it yeah. and then you try to get as much of the vegetable matter as you can out and then it's packaged it and it goes back but uh, wool grease is lanolin which lanolin is used for a variety of things the biggest one being cosmetics so we capture that that's a byproduct of, of wool scouring yeah so lad we're standing here at some wool bales um, what's this hole in it and and why do we do this uh, what are we looking for whenever we're uh, well most wool? wool it's like we talked about earlier most wool is shipped out in a greasy form so you sell it based on a core there's one lab in the United States in Denver uh, Yoakum McCall that it will give you a certified core that's that you can ship worldwide and they'll you know they'll they'll take that information and so basically what you do is is you go to each bale and you put a core tube down it, you know, and it's just cutting the fiber all the way through, and it's taking a sample out, and they 
once you send it to uh, Denver, they'll tell you what the micron is, which is basically the fiber diameter, the yield, and a vegetable matter content. So mm -hmm. that that tells you what the wool is, and, and you know, all bales that come in have a specific lot number so that we know, you know, who that belongs to and what it is, and then they sell it based on that core information. So you talked about microns as a, is that the primary driver of the the value of the wool and it really is yes and yeah. the lab is what is the only way to determine micron or yeah all wool buyers you know can get you close but yeah if you want to know you know specifically what it is then mm -hmm. yes that lab will be the one and the, and they run it through a you know a laser scan that tells you you know exactly what the fiber diameter is so they've got to have a representative sample so when they send wool down if there's 30 bales in there then you know we're going to core every bale so that we have some of you know a, a representative sample of that entire lot mm -hmm. and then it goes to the lab and then that lot will be certified as that micron or yield whatever it is mm -hmm. we're standing in front of a lot of wool and and it's got black face written on it this has been cored you can see some black fibers it's fairly yes. coarse what micron is this and this, How would you use this type of wool in, in your system? Well, I, I mean, since this one's already been cored, I, I know what it is. But, you know, this is, this is about a 30 micron. Uh, and this black face from all over the United States in this. But we cored it together instead of, you know, black face. You know, there's lots of, you know, there's lots of ranchers that use black face bucks. So, you know, when a lot of wool comes in or a truckload of wool comes in, you'll get, you know, 60 bales of white face from their U wools and they have three bales of black face on the back. So when we get enough of it, then we group it together and core it. And, you know, right now the market is, is, is extremely good for uh, the finer types. Uh, you know, about five weeks ago it was hitting record highs for the finer types. But on the other end of the spectrum, it was record lows for the coarse types. Wool's in a big shift right now. And instead of, you know, the old image of wool is, you know, you make socks in a, you know, in a itchy blanket and maybe a sweater out of it. And it's not comfortable next to skin. There's a big shift to it to where now you can go to, you know, academy and, you know, sports stores and they're making next to skin type uh, products, you know, where you can wear it as a t-shirt mm -hmm. or whatever. And to get that feel that's comfortable to wear like that, you need the finer micron. Mm -hmm. So there's a big shift towards the fine end and they're kind of, they've, they've gone away you know, I mean, and it's just a stage. I mean, it'll, you know, it'll change. There'll be uses for the coarse types, but right now, you know, just sitting in the warehouse, you know, even, I mean, I have last year's uh, blackface. Yeah. I've probably got a quarter of a million pounds of blackface here that just isn't moving right yeah. now, so. Is some of that a product of just not having the infrastructure to process this? If the, oh, no. If the stuff's popular on the fine end, are they just running that? Or yes. there's just not that, as much use for this at it's, the point? It, it, it's just like any other market. It's driven by demand, and right yeah. now the demand is for the finer end. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, you know, the coarse wools have been a mainstay for years. You know, there was more mills set up for the coarse types for years than there was for the fine ones. Well, now these mills are shifting and mm. going to the fine stuff just because that's where the market's at. So yeah. it's just a, it's a consumer demand. Yeah. So we're talking about micron. This is about as coarse a micron. A wool is as we see, or do you see a little bit more? And then you what see. is that range on the finer side? Well, you know, I mean, uh, in, it, it's it's dependent on where you're at in the United States. Oregon, Washington, where it rains a whole lot, you get a lot of 32, even 33 micron wools up there. Texas, New Mexico, you know, even the Midwest is known for finer wools. The average for the United States was, this has been several years ago, I don't remember, I don't know what it is now, but would be about 24 to 24 and a half probably. Yeah. But that's starting to go down. And, and, you know, the market is set by Australia and you get you know, on your market reports every week, it comes out of Australia. And before, you know, it would start about 18 micron and go all the way to 32. Well, now if you look at, you know, it's such a shift. If you look at the market report, it starts at 16 and a half and goes to about 23. And then there's very limited um, uh, market information about the course ones because there's just not that much of it in Australia anymore and mm -hmm. so you can see the shift even when you look at the market reports you know we don't have you know I mean if there is any 16 micron wool in the United States it's very yeah. very little yeah. but you know it's starting at the finer end because they're making that shift they're going to where the market's at yeah so I'm wearing a 100% wool t-shirt here yeah. Uh, what micron would that need to be so that it, it's comfortable, it doesn't have the itch, but I get all the value of wool, meaning that it pulls moisture away, right. resists odor? Well, even the fine microns will, 
pull the moisture away and, and, and resist the odor. But I would say, you know, on a t-shirt that's next, next to skin, you're probably looking at 20 micron and under to make that. So, you know, and, and when you talk about, you know, the market, um, you know, used to, you know, 22 to 19 was about the same price. Now there's probably 20 cents in between each half micron going down, you know, in fineness because they're using them just like your t-shirt right there. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the finer you can get, of course, you know, when they do it, you know, they're probably making a blend. They'll take, you know, maybe some 19 and they're making, uh, I mean, and they're taking 17, they're putting it together and running it as one. And maybe that shirt averages 18 micron, which is a very expensive, you know, but there's enough push coming around for natural fibers that people will pay more because they'll last longer. You know, I mean, you may pay double the price for that t-shirt that you could have another one but it'll probably last twice as long so mm -hmm. it's a you know it's it's all consumer demand and there's a big shift going that direction now. so lad we're looking at uh the other end of the spectrum here we were at 30 microns the other side um what type of wool is this what's its background uh, this is just disadvantages this is a merino influenced uh wool out of colorado and this wool, you know where a lot of texas sheep have they do have the fineness for sure but the yields are usually way low uh, these merinos will have a combination of both and it all and it does depend on the area that they run in but uh, you know these like this wool here is 20 and a half micron and yields 65 percent where most of your 20 and a half micron in texas you're going to be lucky to yield from 48 to 52. so the merinos do uh, that they, they bring in another level of you know the fineness and you can get the yield but and it's even been it's even been tried in Texas where they brought merinos down here and they thought well it's just a you know those sheep are yielding so good because of the area they're raised in but you can bring them to the same environment and you know you can see you, you can see the the yield move seven eight percent so we know it's it's not just the conditions it's also the breeding so mm -hmm. uh, there's been a big push for merino lately I mean you, you know when you go by that t-shirt that you were talking about you know it'll say you know made from merino wool it's a it's a big marketing tool and and the u.s is moving kind of towards that too uh, merino is the main sheep that's bred and you know that's the that's the biggest sheep in or biggest breed in uh, australia and they have you know by far the best wool so you want to shoot for you know trying to tr trying to go with with what they're using so mm -hmm. you see a lot more merino influence mm -hmm. And we can notice that yield in this fiber. You, you see very little dirt penetration. It, it's right. really white. Uh, is that that's what's driving that yield? It is. You know, I mean, color is a big thing too. You know, and you know, you can you can make wool any color if you dye it. But you know, there's a big push for the natural look now. And so, uh, you know, to try to get a brightness out of it, you need something that's going to rate. You know, I mean, if you want to make a white product, you don't want to have to dye it white. And mm -hmm. You know, Texas wool is known for being creamy. It's got a yolky color to it, which is due basically to the humidity of, of you know, Texas. And, you know, the drier stuff out in New Mexico will be bright white. This came from Colorado, and, it, and it's got a good bright white look to it. But they're, they're wanting to get away from dyes as much as possible. Of course, if we're going to make a red product, then, yeah, we're going to make it red. But they want to be able to wash something and, and it be bright enough color that they can use that as a white on its own without having to add any, any, any kind of chemical to it. So. Yeah. You know, as you can see, this wool is, is extremely white and, you know, some of the Texas wool will be just as good as uh, in grade, in micron, but it won't have this color to it. Mm -hmm. And the merinos do bring that aspect, you know, kind of kind of to the table for us. Wait, what is this bale worth? That wool, being the merino influence, is probably worth clean 480, 490, something like that. Yeah. Just because it's already put in packs, it's ready to go. There's no, you're not going to have to touch that bear. You're not mm -hmm. going to have to repackage it. You're not going to have to do anything to it. It's ready to be put on the truck and go. So yeah. it's, it's been skirted and, you know, the bellies, tags, everything's out. Um, so it's a $1,500 bale? Yeah, something like that. So $1,500. How many, how many sheep fleeces or sheep are represented in each bale? For the well, those merinos will shear over 10 pounds a head. You know, I mean, in Texas, when you're, you're going to get seven or eight pounds. So, yeah. you know, these merinos are going to shear from, you know, 10 to 13 pounds per head. So, you know, a 450 pound bale, you can, you know, kind of do the math. I mean, it's going to take you 40 sheep or 40. something, you know, and in Texas, it's going to, you're going to have to shear 60 of them. So, Lad, explain to us what we're, what we're doing at the, at the beginning of the process here. 
this will be the first stage. You know, they give me a list of wolves that meet the criteria for what they want to wash. You know, whether it's a micron or a staple length or whatever it is, and we'll put it on the floor here and blend it. These guys are going through it. You know, you find all kinds of odd things, hair, poly are all problems. Paint's a big issue. They're looking for paint as they lay this wool up, but we'll pull it up, put it all on the ground and blend it accordingly to whatever they want, uh, you know, made out of this product. So, yeah. you know, uh, it's all blended here. And then we take it, you know, with a, with a bobcat and put it in the machine. And it's, you know, as it goes up the belts, it's tumbling. You want it as homozygous as you can get. You know, you don't want a chunk of 24 and a chunk of 25 and then a chunk of 21. So, you know, you're, you're trying to blend it all here to make sure that it's an even run when you when you do put it in. You guys look for some contaminants over there and then that wool is is brought over here with a with a skid steer and put into this contraption. What is this? This is an opener. This is in New Zealand they call it a short wool processor. Well compared to New Zealand most of our wool is short but uh, we put that in here and that's just simply a great big opener. It's got teeth at the top you're just and it's got a grate that's open. So as it's opening, the dirt can fall out of the bottom. Yeah. So it's got three different places where it's blended and then it goes through that opener, gets the dirt out, and then it goes on to the scound process. So yeah. we're just trying to save water. Yeah, save water here. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're it's opening up, open it up, blend together. it together, and then try to get as much dirt out as you can. So it's got several processes yeah. that it does here yeah. before it gets to the actual water. Okay. All right, so lad, what do we have here? This is the dirt that's coming out of the bottom of the openers. It's basically vegetable matter, short fiber, and dirt. That's what yeah. it is. So we're just trying to keep this from getting in the water. Right. What it amounts to. Right. This is what you're trying to get out. And you know, all this, all that dirt's full of grease too. So the more you get out, the easier it is to walk. All right. So, so tell us what we've got here, lad. This is the this is the first bolt. So, first bowl. Yeah. It goes from opened up, you know, just raw grease wool into this first bowl. And that water is anywhere from 170 to 180 degrees, and it gets soap added to it. So we're just trying, I mean, this, this bowl catches the majority of the dirt right here. So you're trying to knock the dirt and grease off as much as you can before it goes into another pan. The, you can see it's got the dunker in it. There's a screen right underneath those teeth, so that wool's going in about a foot deep, and it's just constantly moving forward. It stays in that bowl, you know, you know, about seven, eight minutes long, and then the water is squeezed back out, and it, you know, and it carries into another, another. So, tank. so these teeth are just pushing the wool down and then pulling but, it forward, real right. slow. Yep. Yeah. You don't want you don't want too much agitation because wool will start to felt, especially with the hot water on. So. You know, it's a smooth process. There's one bowl that has a little more agitation to it just to move it, you know, yeah. move it a little bit. But you don't, you can't be too rough with wool or else it'll start to felt in the bowl. And then you can't, you know, it's harder to make your, your finished product. So, so I can't throw my fleece in my washing machine at the house and, and clean no, it up. When you, yeah, when, you, when you pull it out, it'd be like a rug, you know, and be stuck no. together. You had mentioned about water use. We want to use as little of water as possible. Tell us what we have here and how that helps that process. Well, you have a press at the end of each bowl. That's basically, you know, that and that's this is our dirtiest water. So we're trying to squeeze that water back out before it goes into the next the next bowl. We don't want it carrying dirt over, so we leave it in this bowl here. So each bowl has a press, and the clean water works its way in down here. What we call the rinse bowl. That'll be the cleanest water, and it works its way back. So this bowl is obviously losing moisture as it, you know, as the day is running. So this bowl will feed in the bowl in front of it. So the clean water just works its way back. It's yeah. just a more efficient. The old school scouring lines, you fill them up with water, and you wash wool for the day. You dump the water out, and you filled it back up. And you did it another day. This wool actually stays in here all week. You know, these lines are designed to run 24 hours a day and you know, seven days a week. That's why you set how much water's going out the bottom, you know, so it, that tells you how much fresh water is gonna come in. So lad, this is the third bowl in the line. What's what's different about this one compared to the fourth? Well, your first three have soap added to them and they're trying, you're, you're trying to get the grease off. And then in the last three bowls, you're rinsing it out. You know, there's a lot of people that think, oh, more soap, more soap, you know, that's cleaner. But there's a fine line between 
not enough soap and too much soap because if you can't get it rinsed back out, well then it shows up just like the grease does as you know a residual grease. So it's bad for processing. So you gotta you, you gotta you know keep and different different type of wools take more or less soap to wash them. So this this bowl is the last one that gets it. Then you have three bowls left to try to rinse the soap back out of. It. So lad, we're on the the fourth bowl here. This is the drain off the fourth bowl. Right. We noticed that the water's gotten a lot cleaner, you know, at this stage. Is it gonna get cleaner all the way to the end? It will, by the time you get to the last bowl, I'm not gonna say you can take a bath in it, but you can see through it. You know, you want your cleanest water right before it goes out. That's your final rinse and you, you know, you're trying to get the last bit of soap or, you know, whatever's left in the wool out of it before it goes onto the dryer. So from here on out, you'll really notice a difference in the water. So this is the, the final bowl. Is this where you evaluate what's coming out, determine you know how fast this runs and everything? Are you looking at the you water do. and the amount of soap that's left over in this last bowl? Well you you do, you can, you can tell you can tell a lot from coming out here, but we don't actually test it until it's already been dried. Yeah. Then we do a test and if there's something wrong with it, then we know we have to make an adjustment. But we do a moisture test and a grease test on each bale as it comes out, but it's got to be dried for us to know if, you know, to make sure that all the washing is done yeah. properly. And as you mentioned before, the water coming out of this last bowl, you know, it's pretty clear there's not a whole lot left there. So no, you don't want a whole lot left here. If it, if it is, that means you're washing some really low yielding, you know, dirty wools, but, yeah. and at times we get that and then you've got to wash extremely slow and it just takes more gallons of water per pound of wool, basically, when you have that really dirty wool type. Do you have a general figure of how many gallons of water per pound, ton, anything I, like that? I would say on average over the year, it's probably three quarters of a gallon to one pound of wool, something like that. That's just an average. Um, you know, every wool is different. Uh, you know, there's some that we wash that'll take over a gallon and a half. And like this wool that we're washing here, this coarse stuff, it may take you know, half a gallon a pound. So it depends on wool type, but I would say as an average, it's somewhere right around three quarters of a gallon per pound of wool. That's why this machine is so much more efficient than the old old type when you would just wash till your water got dirty, dump it out, throw it away. You know, this way we're reusing a lot of yeah. water. You have a general idea how much water we're saving with this newer technology? Well, I know that this line will run about three of what those others used to know that this this line will run about three times as much wool as one of those others with less labor and less water so you know those other ones I would say it would take close to two and a half three gallons of water to wash a pound of wool in those other ones and here we're you know here we've cut it down to less than a gallon so it is much more efficient so we're at the end of the scouring train uh, that wool's got to be dried yes. what do we got here that's a big, that, that, all that is is a hot air dryer. Uh, steam heats the air and then it's got big fans in the back. And it's a drum dryer so that you get more surface area. The old school dryers were just a flat belt. But then you just had the length of the dryer, you know, there wasn't as much surface area. So these are drum drives. That wool is actually going up and over six big drums inside there just to make more use of the, you know, of a shorter dryer. But we try to keep the wool at about 12% moisture. The air inside there is about anywhere from 120 to 140 degrees, and it's just blowing it through it. The wool coming out of here, after the press, will have about 36% moisture left in it, 36 to 40. And then this machine monitors it as it comes out of the back, and we can set it. Some people want a little more, some people want a little less. Uh, you normally never go under 10. It creates too much static, and you can't. It's, the wool becomes hard to work with and it'll yeah. even try to felt itself so about 12 is the average what's the highest that you can go in moisture before it starts to mold? about about 14 percent because then what happens is you could get a hot spot or a wet spot in a bale yeah and you know the water's about the only thing that damages you know wool in this stage so if you had a wet spot in there it could actually start to rot the wool you know inside a bale and that's something that you don't want to see so about 14 is the highest we'll ever let it go okay. All right, so this is wool coming out of the dryer. What do we what do we do now before it needs to be rebaled? Well, 
before we bale it, it'll come out. There, that's your moisture meters right there that's touching it. It'll, it, it'll, it'll keep a control on how much heat the dryer needs to make sure it's wet enough, dry enough, whatever. And then we have, you know, we have pickers that sit here and on this type of wool that we're running right now. There's not a lot to take out, but, you know, specific wool types will need, you know, we have to watch for black fiber or pain or whatever it may be. So we have pickers here that are taking out Thing that doesn't need to be in it before it goes on and from here it goes through two different dusters and through the baby so you said dusters are they taking out any yes yeah they yeah they do they take out dust and it's sent to a bin outside but the dust the vegetable matter is comes out here and then it goes outside to a collection bin. Wool came in in bales and goes out in bales. So, That's right. is this the last stage for this, you? This is. This is the last stage. As it comes down, we'll bale it. Those bales will average 6:30 to 6:50. Uh, every bale that comes out, we core it and do our own uh, moisture and grease test on it. And then it's put on the scale, weighed, written down. There's a cover put over it, and then it's moved to the warehouse and waits for a truck.